again, I apologize for my voice. I'm going to try the best I can. Um, I'm going to the doctor right after this for some steroids. That's what I need to, you know, stop that inflammation that's going on. So, um, so don't worry about me. I'm taking care of me too. <laughs> so here we go. Exam two. I don't believe we're already in exam two. I'm really glad the comments that some of you just gave me about the way I teach, the way I try to make it simple. I was hoping that would work. Um, we don't always need big words. We need to understand what those big words mean. So that's what I try to do for all of you. And I work pretty hard at doing that too. So again, remember this is weeks four, five, six. I will send to all the professors my cahoots for weeks four, five, six, when I send their review recording. So, and I'll send and attach my, um, the PowerPoint. They're all the same, but I try to keep it all in the same place. I mean, my jury will tell you when I have recordings, I keep editing one announcement and everybody's recording is in the same place. So you don't have to go looking. So let's look at the eyes. You know, children have some eye conditions, you know, like sensory. So when you smell, you hear, or your sight are all part of sensory. So there's differences of conditions that children may have. There's amblopia, strabismus, and nystagmus. And you need to know what the differences of them are. Well, amblopia is something we call that lazy eye. Sometimes you see it, even adults, the eye sort of wanders off in an opposite direction. And that's a lazy eye. And how do you treat it? Well, make that lazy eye work, strengthen those muscles cover the good eye, and that will help that bad eye um, get better. Rarely do they need surgery. Now, strabismus is when you're born, you have this, you look from one eye to the other eye, but they don't work together. That's as they get older. With strabismus, both eyes, they try to come together to work, but they go past each other. So basically, they're moving back and forth trying to focus. And that works also with the depth perception. They really can't see that well. So it's that movement of those eyes moving across what we call midpoint. We don't come to looking at your finger ahead with each eye, they sort of go past it. That's what that means. Now, cognitive impairments. Well, cognitive impairments, sometimes we can see because they just look different. You know, it could be, you know, Down's children, the ears are low set, we'll see the tongue, the almond eyes, we'll see creases, those things we can see. But sometimes we don't see it physically. Is some other things, those behaviors that they show. So what are you gonna see? Well, if it's not a dysmorphic looking something, it's going to be that child who's irritable for no reason. And the reason is, is they don't know how to explain what they need because cognitively they don't know how to express themselves. Sometimes they get in an environment, they're not gonna answer to their name. They get in their little world and they play. So they are not seeing what's happening around them. Of course, cognitive delays we see with gross motor and fine motor. Gross motor means maybe they're not walking when they should. Maybe it's lifting their head up, turning over, walking, um, crawling. If there's a delay, um, we know it has to do with cognitive impairment. I mean, we know sometimes it could be nutritional issues, but sometimes and many times it's not. And then fine motor, they can't pick up little things with their fingers by a year old. They should. Remember, F is all about fingers and what they can do, buttoning shirts at four years old. They should be able to do that. And if they can't, we need to look. Also, many children with cognitive delay cannot speak and express themselves. Again, therefore, why they get irritable. They can't talk. They can't tell you what they want. But they're not saying two syllable words, you know, mommy, daddy, uh, more milk. Um, those things should be able to come out by the first year of life. Sometimes it's just grunts and groans and screeches. 
that could be what you hear. Again, behaviors just like that irritability. And again, those developmental milestones, being able to walk, you know, at least stand up by one year, being able to um, take the rattle from hand to hand by seven months. They're not doing that. Something's going on and it needs to be looked at. I've mentioned my little cardiac children. I think probably working with these children as a teenager is one of the reasons why I went into pediatrics and why I love Down's children so much. The most loving, caring uh, children I've ever met. And they're very easy to distinguish, even as brand new newborns. You'll see short, stubby fingers and toes. If you look in their mouth, that palate is up and it's pointed on top. And we also know that big tongue is always hanging out. Those really beautiful almond-shaped eyes. Many of these children have cardiac conditions, VSD being the biggest one. They also hypotonia, which means you can take their feet, put them behind their head, and they can just lay there stretched out in positions that we go, oh my God, how did they do that? Their muscles just stretch out as much as they want. You know, also uh, the creases, and then the, between the big toe and their feet is this bigger space. It almost looks like your hand. It's just that big space, and then the four toes, we can see it. But one of the most distinguishable things, and as nurses, we need to teach our parents about is because of that underdeveloped nasal bone, mucus gets caught there, especially with tonsils and adenoids, and they are prone to multiple upper respiratory infections. I mean, upper respiratory infection is a cough and mucus, right? If it's stuck and dripping on the trachea, what are you doing? Well, you're full of mucus and you're coughing. So that underdeveloped nasal bone is what causes it. So Down's children are some of the ones that really need um, someone there to help them during hospitalization. Remember, they're cognitively delayed. They want mom and dad or somebody they know being with them. So to decrease the anxiety of Down's children and many of our younger toddlers and preschoolers, we need those parents to stay with those children as much as possible because they do get anxious, they do get stressed. And we don't want hospitalization to be a stressful experience for children. They get enough of that with all the pinches and things we need to do to them. So here we are with verbal milestones to follow up if not accomplished. Well, this is why we learn all those developmental things. If we're not making a sound by two months, we need to institute early intervention. You can see children that are so far behind get into early intervention, which means what? Put them into speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. And those children who couldn't speak are speaking beyond other children if they get the treatment early as they possibly can. We know infants by two months should make like a, a noise and they're trying to verbalize and they're also calling you, right? Because they say, hey, mom, hello, come over here, I'm here. And three to four months, you know, they love for mom and dad and other people to uh, be around them. So they coo and they laugh because people think that's really the cutest thing they've ever seen, right? So you think infants don't know something? I'm telling you, infants are smarter than most people. Um, it's amazing. They can wrap you around a little finger quick. By eight months, they're going to start to be imitating sounds. And by 10 months, it's no. You know, and they start with that no, which we know is part of the toddlers. They love to say no, 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 my, my. And that's the toddler. By one year old, three to five different words, usually mommy, dada, daddy. Um, I know one of my grandson's first word was Nana because Nana has always been a part of it. So I'm really proud to say that, yeah, my grandson loves his Nana too much. Now by um, infants that um, are not uh, around um, people or are not talking, they're not imitating uh, what's going on, really needs to be followed up. So maybe they're not hearing what's going on. 
okay? So if a child is not where they should be with speech, always remember if they're not up with speech, always check the hearing first because they're interconnected. Speech, hearing is those two things that you need to worry about. Now, autism. Now, autism, these children, usually we don't know or even think of autism until ages two to three. We won't make a diagnosis to them. We can sort of think maybe, but you will not get that you know, diagnosis till ages two or three. So what do you see with an autistic child? Well, they're not gonna look you in the eye. They um, are in their own little world. They're going to be sitting in a corner, playing alone, doing repeated, repetitive behaviors taking a truck, putting it on a chair, taking a car, putting it next to it, take a piece of paper, put it on top, take the piece of paper off, take the car off, take the chair off, repeat, repeat, repeat. And they could do it 28 times. That's what they love to do. So that repetitive behaviors, they're not going to do what other kids do. They're not going to try to imitate. Okay. They're not going to answer to their names. They just, you know, their little world is here and they don't hear, they don't see. It's not that they have problems with hearing, it's they don't want to, they, they block it out. So another thing is these children cannot stand crowds, bright lights, and noises. Some of them don't like certain foods because of textures. And when we start seeing these things, this is when they're going to go and uh, to a psychologist uh, to try to figure out what's going on. Now, immunizations are so important. We know diseases can be prevented by immunizations. Now, when do we give them? When do we don't? Now, one of the questions that you'll see if med surge adults or in children don't matter. We do not give live vaccines to a child who's immunosuppressed. We cannot, but the family can, the brothers and sister can. It is not a problem at all. Now, immunosuppressed could be having a disease like sickle cell or cystic fibrosis or one of those, but it also could mean that they're on steroids. Remember, when you're on steroids, you are immunosuppressed. So how do you educate these parents about getting their child immunized? Many parents will not because of many different reasons. I've listed a few here, religious reasons, personal beliefs, or safety concerns, or before they get in immunization, they want to do more research to understand, yeah, should I or shouldn't I? The first vaccine is hep B, which should be given in the hospital before discharge. Sometimes it's not, and you're gonna say, well, then why not? Well, sometimes it just has to do with some um, insurance problems. They're not gonna pay it till they get to the doctors. Yeah, and that's silly and it's stupid, but you know, that's medicine and it happens. But hep B is your first vaccination. So you have a child admitted to a hospital, extremely ill. In ICU, they um, can't get out of bed, they're so ill. How do we take care of these children? Well, I'm gonna ask you, does it matter if you're a child or an adult, you're immobilized in a bed and you're ill with a condition that doesn't allow you to get up and out of bed? No, there's no difference in how we treat for them. It's just the size of the child or the adult, right? So number one, number one, number one, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Without nutrition, how are you going to heal? How are you going to get better from whatever condition? Many times in children is overwhelming sepsis that has occurred. Remember, draw sheets. That helps eliminate that pulling across those sheets and getting like, you know, your skin ripped off. And yes, children will get their skin ripped off like adults. I mean, you know, um, Oh, elderly people, their skin shares easier, but don't think children can't go that way too, especially if they are in uh, like an overwhelming sepsis. Their body just doesn't have, you know, that extra nutrition to take care of that. It's fighting other stuff. Make sure that they keep them dry, whether it's with a chucks, that moisture reduction pad or diapers, keep them dry as much as possible. They still need to be turned. And you're gonna use, it's pretty cool that we can take 
and put um, those cute little blankets that they get, roll them up, put them behind them, in front of them, underneath an arm, hold their arm up, underneath their legs, keep them up and position beautifully. Pillows, blankets, all of that stuff. Use whatever we need to do to keep them up because that side up lets that lung get fully expanded and it does help with pulmonary care on that. Also, you think that children don't get decubituses? They can. Okay, just like adults do. Because remember, they are sick, their body's not at optimum state, and they will break down. So rub those prominences like you would in an adult. So children admitted going to the hospital. It's a hard thing for parents and is a hard thing for children. So what we need to do is get that kid comfortable and as stress-free as possible because they are absolutely like, oh, this is not my normal routine and I'm scared. And you don't want a child to remember hospitalizations of being scared, especially those who require frequent hospitalization. So put the baby on mommy's lap. It's actually a program I developed at Nicholas Children's Hospital here in Miami called Huggies, H period, U period, G period. It's an acronym. Help us give great injections efficiently and safely. And what I proposed is that children be held by the parents or somebody or caregiver so that they had decreased stress and pain before and during and after that injection. And with research proved that kids did do better because they cried less. So holding a child is something that we are doing now. So sitting on a lap, doing an assessment, doesn't that kid feel more comfortable? And if they don't wanna look at you, they turn around and hug mommy and then you could, you know, listen to their back, right? Listen to their breast sounds that way. Now taking care of children in hospitalizations and allowing them to express their feelings, many times they don't know the words, they don't know exactly why they're uh, scared. So we have expressive activities where they can release all that stress and you know, they can play, pound on things, whatever they need to do, you know, to help release that stress. Now, dramatic play is where we can find out what happened to a child that gave them such fear and stress of being in a hospital. It is well organized. So it could be that the child goes and picks up an empty syringe and sticks it in the, the doll or a teddy bear. And you're like, oh, somebody came up and just pulled them down and stuck a needle in them. You know, now we're understanding what the child doesn't know how to express. Um, because you ask them what's wrong and you know what a kid do? They don't say nothing because they're afraid of saying the wrong things many times. And then of course, coloring, drawing, painting, these things allows them to express their feelings. They could be missing their brothers, their sisters, or maybe their bike at home and they could draw these pictures. So play again through these activities. We can find a lot about these children. Now, children, um, it used to be we didn't med medicate them as much as we did with adults. And uh, probably my biggest pet peeve in pediatric nursing and something that I did help correct um, was about medicating for children for pain like we do with adults. Medicate before the pain is not that bad. Knowing when they got their last medicine and medicating them before they might need it. If they just had surgery that day or the day before, go ahead and give them their medicine because you know that they're in pain. They're not going to ask. They think again, a needle's coming after them because that's a preconceived idea because sometimes they did get that injection. So if you have a child, let's say they are um, post-op uh, some sort of abdominal surgery. It could be as simple as an appendix or maybe a ruptured appendix, okay? And now they're not breathing deep. What's happening? The lungs are gonna, gonna get full of fluids and ronchi and you could run into a lot of problems if the child does not cough and deep breathe properly. Now, if you just have abdominal surgery, are you going to cough, deep breathe, use incentive spirometry, get out of bed, walk without medicine? Oh, no. 
So what you'll do is give them something for pain and you're gonna do distraction things like give them a movie on TV they like or many hospitals and children's, they have these, you know, Mario brother games and whatnot. It's this little console that can go from room to room if they need. You know, if I was a little boy and I saw a little car game and even though I was in pain, I'm gonna play it. And guess what? I forgot that I had pain. And you go in to have them deep breathe, cough, get out of bed. They're not in pain now. Guess what? Children get up and move because they're, they're not in pain. So they'll do everything you need to help prevent complications. So number one, medicate for pain. Use distraction methods. And then you can get them out of bed, cough, deep breathe, instead of spirometry, ambulate, all those things you need to do. Uh, yes. Can I ask you, Ms. Bogart? Now, with the pain, um, do you use the flat um, scale to do the pain level? It depends on the age of the child. Okay. You know, we know flack is used for those nonverbal children and children that are infant to up through toddler. And at preschool, it changes to faces. At your book says at eight years old, then you can use a numeric scale. And of course, you will try to find out what their pain levels is. It's part of what we call the fifth vital sign. JCH um, put that in fruition in the early 2000s where they said, we need to know what the pain is and we need to know what you did for it and if it worked. And um, it created a lot of different programs that now we are watching their pain a lot better. And remember, pain isn't just medicine. It could be repositioning, and it also could be acetaminophen or ibuprofen with it, or it could be elevating the head of bed. It could be hot pack, cold pack, putting a pillow somewhere. All of those things are involved in taking care of pain. Now with infants, you cannot give anything but Tylenol every four hours until six months old. Aspirin is never given unless what? Kawasaki disease. It's the only time that we will give it. But if we're going to give, let's say, morphine um, in two hours, especially after abdominal surgery, I'm going to be given acetaminophen or ibuprofen. I'm going to do it, you know, one or the other and make sure that first uh, day or two that that child can get up and can move and prevent complications. So nothing but Tylenol for the first six months. Now, many children get um, IVs. You know, I actually became a very expert kids uh, IV starter because this is the, only, the reason why I almost didn't become a nurse because I was afraid of, you know, needles. So if you see swelling, redness, leaking, anything, what's your first thing? Turn it off. You know, then you could go and look and maybe it's a kink in the tubing or something or Maybe the arm was down, but it flushes, good blood return, you know. But the first thing, I mean, 10 mLs on a little baby this big is actually a lot of fluid to put underneath the skin. So number one, stop the infusion, you know, elevate it. Um, if we find that it's definitely infiltrated, take it out. If it's swelled too much, tell the physician. Or if there's just an order to restart it, just go ahead and restart a new IV in a different extremity. Now, gastrostomy tubes, there's all types. I mean, you can see the one here to the left looks like a Foley catheter hanging out. And then the one to the right is this little MIC tube, which is great because that extension can come off in between every feed. Now they've done all different things with what sort of site care to do, but soap and water is absolutely the best thing to do. Uh, at least once a day, I would do it every shift and they can lay on it. It's not a problem. Just keep it so it's not pulling and tugging. Now, oxygen, you know, variations in care in pediatrics. Well, adults don't get to have an oxy hood. But you see that, that little cute little baby just staring around, his hands are up, they can go in, suck his fingers, and he's getting oxygen, the best tolerated, and it is regulated really well with that. We just put the flow underneath, and we have a monitor that monitors how many percent that's in there. 
Now, the second thing you would do is a nasal cannula, but it's not as good as an oxy hood. And um, this uh, ventilated, that's difficult for an infant to tolerate. I've been intubated. I know what it feels like. And even though you know there's a big tube and it's open and it's not closed, you feel like you're gagging and can't breathe. It's horrible. And then the other thing is this, what we call CPAP. Um, and it goes into the nose, but you can see the contraption. It could be quite uncomfortable for that infant. So oxyhood's the best. If you want to know how many liters equals what, you know, this is a diagram for you, you know, and of course, not only will we be using this, we'll also be measuring. There's ways to measure the oxygen flowing in. There's all different things to measure that today. Now, urinary catheterization. Now, I know most parents are like, I don't want you to stick a catheter in my child. They think they're going to be divergenized, or if it's a male, that it's going to hurt, it's going to be horrible. And I will say this, if you have a child and you can smell the urine and they're with fever and showing all the symptoms with abdominal pain, some vomiting, fever, smelling urine or discolored urine, we know it's a urinary tract infection. You want to treat that infection with one antibiotic so we were not going to hurt our kidneys. Because if we have to put a bag on, which you can't clean in, you know, around the penis completely, all of the stuff that's just on there normally, or even in between the labia on a uh, female, it's hard to get all of that you know, debris out, you're not going to get an accurate urine specimen. So the best accurate way of determining what antibiotic is going to work the first time with an infant is a catheterization. So what do I do? Well, number one, I have a little um, pacifier with a little sugar water, and I have mom holding the hands and just talking to her baby. I, as a nurse, would hold the infant. Another nurse would come quick, get it. It's uncomfortable for a second, and then it's done. Now, they said you can use some lidocaine jelly, um, and you put it there before you start it, and it can numb it. But I'm telling you, as soon as it's in, it's out, and it's really not that bad. So make sure that these parents know why you're doing it. It's not going to cause permanent damage, and you are not diverginating your poor little girl there. Now, taking labs is another thing. We do not have to do a uh, vein every time we take labs. The only time we need to do um, labs by sticking a needle and getting it maybe into the anticube would be for blood cultures or any bleeding coagulopathies like PT, PTT, those we can't. But CBC, all of your electrolytes, uh, blood levels, dig levels, all those things can come from the heel. Now, the best way is to use and be very careful with this an approved hospital heel warmer. Do not take, you know, a washcloth, put it in a microwave or use hot water and put it on their heel. You can burn. And I've seen burns on children's heels because of this. Another thing, if you ever want to work in pediatrics, and I'm just sharing a trick, it's not a book anywhere. But if you hold the foot down, I'll put like the stretcher up if they're on a stretcher. I will sit down below. I will hang the heel and I'll heat it up with a hospital approved warmer and then hit it in the appropriately outside of the heel and slowly squeeze. And because gravity goes down, I can fill up two, three lab um, little tubes very, very easily. So that's just a trick I share with you. Intake output, what do I count? I mean, you need to know this for med surge too, right? So depends on how severe of intake and output do you need? I mean, what condition are we looking at? I mean, are you looking at congestive heart failure or are you just looking at normal? Let's just look at it. So if we wanna be strict, anything taken by mouth, anything that is IV. Who is that? Somebody, gotcha. Okay, anything taken by IV, 
even when we give medicines and use a 3cc and flush it, those flushes should count too. Because if you've given six meds, it could be a, another ounce of fluid that you give this child. Output, urine, stool, vomit, any drainage coming from anywhere. And you can measure sweat. Let's say you put them on a chuck, those blue pads, right? With just a diaper on. So you take a measurement of that chucks before you put it down. And I usually will write it on the corner of it. And when I get it off and it's wet, I'll measure it. And the ML per gram is what my um, output would be. So you have a dry diaper and you have a wet diaper. The difference between the dry diaper and the wet diaper in grams equals an ML is every gram. So a diaper weighed 30 um, when it was dry and now weighs 60, my urinary output is 30. So another thing, how do you get a child to take their medications? You know, this has always been, oh, please help me. My kid doesn't want to take it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's all different things we can use. The one thing I'm going to tell you, never, ever, 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 ever put it in a bottle. Because if they don't take all the bottle, how much medicine did they take? If it's a little tiny bit of fluid in a spoon, that's one thing but you're not gonna put it in a bottle. If you take it and you squirt it on the side of the mouth, little by little, you can get a kid, you put it in there and then you take a deep breath in and <sighs> real quick and they get scared and they swallow and it works. It's better than holding their nose, holding them down, pushing their cheeks and trying to get it in and it works. And I've used it repeatedly uh, for many types of children and it, it does work. Now that stress and that hospitalization of a child, we know that those children who are in there the most frequent, like your sickle cell or children with Crohn's disease or cystic fibrosis that are in and out of hospitals, those kids are gonna have the most stress because somewhere along the line, I'm sure they've had a bad experience. I mean, our goal as future nurses is to make sure these kids never get upset, okay? But, you know, we're not in control all the time. Now, knowing that, we need to be able to explain and help these kids through these experiences. And maybe those kids need to go to some of that dramatic play, right? To find out what went on. Um, but we know that separation anxiety or separating a child from a parent is the biggest stressor they could stay and they should be able to stay in the room. Now, we know that males ages five to six tend to have the most stress. And especially again, if your child has cognitive impairment like Downs, these children don't understand. So making sure that they make arrangements, if at all possible, to stay with their child is the best thing for the child. Now, when they're in a hospital, one of the things that they can go through is called regression. So this child initially is going to be screaming, yelling, and carrying on, and you know, misbehaving, you know, um, and you can you don't know what to do for them. And then all of a sudden, they're going to stop. And they go and they regress. How would you see this? Well, it'd be the kid who wants a bottle who has been, you know, on a sippy cup for a year, a kid who's been potty trained, who is now being incontinent. Um, all of these things um, that you see that are going backwards on these children is you will see these with children. So again, how do we help? Well, number one, try to keep the parents together as a nurse, being on their developmental level, explaining things as they go through, you know, and you can, and distraction, distraction also can help. So trying to get the kid through hospitalization is difficult. Now, sometimes um, children tend to have um, a stress with everything that's going on. So again, 
you know, keep the parents there. As I said, development, developmentally, let them play and touch and hold things, have them take your temperature, your blood pressure. You know, if you need to start an IV, you know, letting them touch the little tiny little plastic little tube, getting child life involved in it, you know, and maybe tell them, do you see a little blue line where you want me to put that IV? And sometimes being involved in the care, you'd be surprised they are less stressed when you do that. Again, keep them on the same routine as much as possible. Like, what is that? Well, most children wake up, they wash their face, brush their teeth, they have breakfast. Try to keep foods as much as possible the same. You know, have them dress in something for the day. Maybe they have, you know, special jammies for daytime and special jammies for nighttime or maybe little shorts or something, something that's inappropriate for their care. You know, um, having nap time the same time, um, bath at the same time, eating, and of course the same foods, try to keep it the same as home. And what that is, is that child knows now what their routine is because it's what they do at home. So it eliminates stress. So again, um, with parents, just always know that parents need to be involved. They need to tell you what their children need. And again, I can't tell you more than once, keep the parents with them. So chronic otitis media, ear infections. I think the picture on top is probably the more of severe is probably the eardrum has ruptured and all this mucus is coming out. The problem with ear infections is that these children can have um, a long-term uh, problem with hearing because of it. But if you've ever had an earache, you know, the kid comes in and you ask them what hurts and they say, tell you your ear. Your number one priority is give them something for pain because simple ibuprofen and an ear problem, you have eliminated pain. And what does that allow a child to do? It allows them to be able to be the kid again, to drink, to eat, and on, they're not just remembering those, uh, the pain in their ear. Again, they're gonna get pain medicine, make sure you give it regularly before, you know, think of it before it's overdue. Make sure you give it on time for these kids until we get that infection clear and they will be getting um, oral antibiotics and they need to know why they're taking it because you don't want that pain in your ear anymore, right? And also you could have surgery in tubes. Now there's different sort of respiratory issues, bronchitis. Have you ever had bronchitis? Keeps you awake at night with this dry barking cough and you cough, 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 cough. So the biggest symptom and the way that we describe is non-productive dry hacking cough worse at night. How do we treat it? Well, most of them are viral, but uh, we treat it cough medicine and many of um, physicians will put these children on zithromycin, it's just what they do. You don't have to have a fever with bronchitis. So the symptom, the big one you need to know is either the same word, tracheobronchitis or bronchitis. It's the same thing, okay? Just like RSV and bronchiolitis, same thing. But with bronchitis, it's a dry hacking cough worse at night. And then you're gonna say croup. It's the same thing as bronchitis, right? Yeah, no, it's different. What you see with croup is usually a low grade fever, like 100, usually below 101, not that much, just enough to feel miserable. And you'll bark like a, a seal. And it's, um, you, you, it's not literally related to a dry cough at night. It is, most of the time it is, and it is treated as a virus. So what we do is we give this child some steroids to decrease the swelling, which will decrease the cough, which is similar to what I need to go because I think my trachea is all swollen to this. Well, I can't talk. So um, I'm gonna go get my solumedrol shot today. But problem with croup, if we don't treat it, and you're gonna hear that, 
inspiratory strider, okay? It's hard to get air in. Going out is easy because it barks, it coughs, it coughs. But going in, it's, you'll hear that strider um, and it can turn into epiglottitis, all right? Now, asthma. Asthma is an uh, illness that we see a lot in children and it is a bronchospasm, which you're gonna have coughs, uh, difficulty breathing, um, and you're gonna hear wheezing, like this expiratory as it comes out. It's like you get air in well, then it gets trapped. And then it's, you know, it's all swollen, gets stuck, and it's hard to get rid of it. And um, asthma, we know the way that we treat it is by giving them a rescue. Rescue is albuterol. Now, many times you're going to see children come into the doctor, urgent care ER, complaining that, you know, um, they're coughing and coughing and it's not getting any better. My first question, how are you giving the rescue medicine, the albuterol, the venolin, provental? They're all the same thing, different names. Well, how are you giving it? Now, how many three, four-year-olds can puff it and inhale at the same time without a spacer? It ain't gonna happen usually. So first question, how did you give it? Did you use a spacer? And if they haven't used a spacer, I'll tell the physician, he'll say, get a spacer, give it to them. And we will know that asthma is getting better when we see decreased wheezing, okay? So, Symptoms, chronic, non-productive cough, diffuse expiratory wheezing. And this child, I rarely, rarely is there a fever with this kid. So usually no fever at all. Okay, cystic fibrosis. You all are doing the case study this week, which is good because you know, you're going to see some items about cystic fibrosis. Obviously it's on your study guide here. It is inherited, it's an autosomal recessive, comes from both parents. Many times cystic fibrosis, parents don't know that they have a trait and they get together and they don't know to look for it. And uh, whether or not it's looked for in the pregnancy, you know, uh, lab values they do, um, whether you could do them or not, so how would you know a kid is cystic fibrosis if you have no idea? Well, a child, an infant born with cystic fibrosis is not going to move their bowels within the first two days of life. And this alerts the physician, let me go looking. Cystic fibrosis is usually that's the way they find it. So this meconium ileus, which means they're just not moving their bowels. I mean, most infants have that green, gooey, black sort of stool, the first one, and they're not gonna do it. I mean, if they have uh, metabolic screening, oh, you can find it too, but many times um, it's going to be not moving their bowels. And then what do they do? They do a sweat chloride test. I mean, I told my students that if you lick this kid, you're going to taste salt. I mean, that's how much salt's in it. But please don't lick your infants. You could tell the parents to, but please don't put your tongue on an infant. Uh, but really, it is that salty. So again, you're not going to limit salt on this kid at all. So what's other things you see? Now, cystic fibrosis uh, affects two things. It's the pancreas and the small uh, intestines, and it's the lungs. So what is that? Well, the lungs get full of thick clogged mucus, and it sits there and it occludes space to be able to breathe. So what do we need to do for that? Well, this is what we call vigorous, vigorous, vigorous respiratory care. This child's going to have like that vest. You see the pink one and the black one in this girl. It shakes like this. And it's like giving chest CP, um, chest physiotherapy, but it's that vest that's shaking. And then get an aerosol opening up the lungs and many different aerosols are given. So pulmonary, pulmonary you really need to give aggressive just physical therapy, keep those lungs open and moving, or it's a Petri dish. It's just going to start growing bacteria. 
The other things you will see is because of the pancreas and small bowel problems and all this mucus there, you're going to have the most nastiest smelling stools you've ever smelled. And they do not absorb fat. So what about those fat vitamins that they should be getting? Well, they're not. So vitamins A, D, E, K, fat vitamins, you'll be losing them. You're not being able to absorb a lot of your nutrients. So you're going to lose weight. Because of the lungs, you're going to be wheezing, short of breath, and you're going to have that dry, non-productive cough because it's low and thick stuff in there. And these children are in and out of the hospital due to respiratory infections. So how do we treat cystic fibrosis? Well, I think you know the lungs, we take care of the respiratory component. But what do we do for the nutritional part, the, the pancreatic involvement? Well, we need to give these children um, a uh, vitamins for them. We need to also give them um, extra salt in their diet because they're losing it like crazy. And then we need to give them these pancreatic enzymes. It says 30 minutes before, it's like right before. It's not like an hour, 30, right before they eat, they need to take it because it helps the food to digest. Now, what do we need to teach our parents and our children if they're older? Well, number one, you never crush or chew any enteric coated extended meds at all. So we know that one. If you have a capsule and you, you can take it whole, do that. But if not, you can open it and sprinkle it on the food. This is the only time you can do that. You know, that you could put it on food in any medications. And then if it's a powder, make sure we rinse our mouth because it will damage you know, your gums and whatnot. And then the one thing I think we forget is that um, children grow and they need bigger doses as they get older. One of the things with cystic fibrosis, boys don't have a vas deferens and they're unable to produce sperm to have children. One of the things about um, this is let's say you have a, a guy. Now girls can get pregnant. They don't recommend it. You know, um, it's better if they have the transplant, but boys can't, can at all. They cannot get pregnant, you know, get a woman pregnant until they get a double lung transplant. One year later, all of a sudden their chances of being able to deliver sperm to the woman goes way up and then they can have children. Very um, interesting fact that they're born, they can't, and then with a transplant, they can. Why and how, it just works. Now, tonsillectomy, very common in children, those big tonsils, usually it's tonsils and adenoids, you know, big, thick things. Uh, we usually give it to children who are having multiple strep throats and tonsillitis and even ears. They might even do ears and tonsils all at the same time because it's all interconnected. So how do you take care of tonsils after surgery? Well, you're not going to give them any foods that can irritate the area because, you know, that, that area is so um, open um, and raw, it'll burn. Um, also, these children have to rest. I've actually seen clots from the size of this tonsil. One week after surgery, child went to the doctor, ENT was seen, given a clear bill of health on the way home. The child, she coughed or something, and all of a sudden she was vomiting like liver clots of blood coming out of her. And she actually went hypovolemic and almost went into shock. We had to start an IV and pour fluids in her because of the bleeding. She went to the OR and they zapped her back of her throat. But, you know, of course I was, who was the triage nurse? It was me. And so I ran that kid, picked her up, held her. Some kid held, um, the mother held a basin as she's vomiting this clots of blood back to the trauma room and immediately put her head down, got, you know, to, but of course watching airway suction at bedside, got an IV in and flew it on the fluids into her and she was fine and everything was fine. But I'm telling you, 
please reduce the amount of activity because it can happen even a week later. They need fluids. I mean, even though it hurts, they still need fluids. And then ice on the neck really, really helps. But just remember if you're giving ice pops, do not give red ones because do you know, is it blood or is it popsicles, right? So make sure they're not red. Another thing you can do is older children, um, if they chew gum, it can help with the pain in their ears. It just works. I mean, younger kids don't know how to chew gum. They just, they swallow it like it's, you know, a couple bites of food, but older kids chewing gum can really help. And then one of the telltale signs is when you see a kid post-op tonsillectomy um, swallowing a lot, they're probably bleeding. So um, these children need to go right to their physician. Now kids get cold, nasal colds, we get colds and we can't breathe out of our nose. You know, so we're there at night breathing out of our mouths, our mouths are dry and we feel miserable. So we, we take some Afrin, four-way, you know, ephedrine, one of those things. Just be careful to teach these parents that if we use it more than three days, they say three to five, but three is, is good enough. After three days, if you don't stop it, that rebound congestion you feel is gonna be worse than the congestion you had when you started. So not to overuse it, only use it as needed. All right, I went into asthma. All right. How did I get two ways here? Croup. Croup is a barking thing, we know that, and the treatment here is the steroids and of course the epi, sorry about that. RSV. RSV is another name for bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is, um, for you and me, a common cold. And what are you going to see in a child? Well, these children, are going to have all this mucus up in their nose and going up into their ears. And um, an infant has a hard time just sucking, swallowing, and breathing. So give that kid, a normal kid, that they're going to have troubles, you know, just eating, you know, drinking their bottle. But what if that kid also had a cardiac condition? So are they already weak or they had cystic fibrosis or they're premature? We don't want these children to get, you know, RSV. So during the months of like winter to early spring, every month they give an immunization called Synergis or Pavizumab, and that helps prevent. It's an immunization against RSV. And um, that is how we help prevent that in those kids. Mononucleosis, kissing disease, you know, if you've had my class, you've heard the story about the poor little boy who, you know, had gone to the doctor, urgent care, seven days after having a sore throat, fever, feeling horrible, finally came to the emergency room. And what they did um, was they did a monospot test and a CBC. Well, the CBC showed it was a virus because mononucleosis is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. So we treat it with Tylenol and Motrin. The biggest problem with mononucleosis is you must be careful of their tummies. So if you have a child who has mononucleosis, you must tell these parents and the child, they must protect their abdomens. No PE in school. If they're in sports, they cannot go to sports until they're cleared by their pediatrician. And also um, these children, um, if they, I had one child and I'll go into the story, the nine-year-old who came in, who we said, yeah, you have mono, please be careful of, you know, your child's abdomen. And one week later, I was the trauma nurse, uh, the primary on duty. And this kid came, he was out in the Everglades riding a trike and he fell off and hit his abdomen on the ground and his spleen burst. And by the time he got to me, he had died. So it is serious. So please teach your parents and the child not to do anything um, that could hurt his belly. Okay, 
going into cardiac conditions. Well, Tetralogy of Fallot is the most common of all um, cyanotic heart diseases. And Tetralogy of Fallot is all on the right side of the heart. So before the exam, please go look at how a drop of blood goes through a heart, okay? What are the valves? What do they go through? Very important. So Tetralogy of Fallot literally has the pulmonary artery, which is sitting in the right ventricle. Blood comes out of the body, goes through the right side and goes up into the lungs, gets oxygenated. Sometimes the valve, the pulmonary um, artery valve tends to get like some tissue, it closes, it's there's stenosis and some tissue goes over it and it covers it so completely that no blood can get to the lungs. I have seen a little baby that his name was Nathan, I'll never forget him. Um, at five o'clock in the morning, changing a diaper, he decided to have a tet spell. That piece of tissue covered the pulmonary artery. When I started with that infant, his sets were 100. Within 15 seconds, I mean, it was quick. He was saturating 10, one zero. So how did I treat him? Now you see that little baby there with the knees up? I push him quick up into the chest. Well, this kid was on the side. So I took his neck, took his knees and I pushed knees to the ch uh, chest. And hopefully that will displace the pressure in the abdomen and it will displace the uh, pressure up into the chest and it will pop open that valve and allow blood to flow. So it is a surgical repair, they will do it. Now, sometimes children are older when they finally fix it. Um, so you might have an older child who has a tet spell. And just like this little boy up there, if he feels it's coming, just naturally they squat to the ground. They just know what to do, okay? So here's your congenital heart defects, the different types. We know um, we have the patent ductus arteriosus, which we know connects what? This connects pulmonary artery to the aorta. And it is used a lot to put the oxygen blood from the lungs to the body when there's no connection inside the heart. We use it a lot for things like tricuspid atresia because there's no blood going to the lungs at all, okay? It's, there's A, atresia, A, without nothing. There's no movement. It's like that flap going over that uh, pulmonary artery in a, a TED spell. And um, we need to get blood there. So we'll leave that patent ductus arterius open. And of course, transposition, because you have unoxygenated and oxygenated blood and they're not mixing at all. So how do we keep that open? Well, during pregnancy, mom secretes this hormone called prostaglandins. And this prostaglandins hormone keeps that little connector open. That's part of fetal circulation. But after birth, mommy's gone, right? Baby's on its own, what are you gonna do? Well, you're going to put them on a synthetic prostaglandins and it works and it keeps it open. Now, sometimes mommy um, has the baby and it's premature, which is usually when it happens. And that patent ductus arteriosus just refuses to close. So we can actually give medicines to say prostaglandins go away. We've had enough of you. So it is called indomethacin that we give that says stop prostaglandins and let that duct close. And that's the medical treatment for that. Now, how do we know if an infant's born with a congenital heart defect? Well, if they have a defect, that means something's not working right. That means the heart has to try to work harder for the blood to get around. So if we see a heartbeat, an infant should be 140 to 160 heart rate. So if it's above 160 at rest, something's going on. Also, their respiratory rate is 40 to 60. So if we see it above 60, they're trying to breathe you know, fast, their heart's beating, they're breathing faster. And then because the heart's not working well, you might see swelling, you might see some cyanosis, but most of all, the biggest thing that you will see is these children 
their body, their heart, their lungs are trying so hard to get blood around oxygen to the body that they tire easy. So they do not have energy to eat. So you will see a child just tire out when they're eating. I mean, if they're tiring out when they're eating really quick, they're breathing fast, heart rate's elevated. The first thing I'm going to do is listening to their lungs. And I'm probably going to start to hear some congestive failure going on. Or maybe I'm going to hear a murmur. Or sometimes it might be that um, we might have something called that coarctation, that kink. So I might see pulses in the lower extremities just aren't there. So transposition, just like that tricuspid atresia. You know, this is a heart defect where blood is not getting oxygenated and it's not getting to the body. So we're going to put these children on prostaglandins. And then now we have a connection to the lungs, to the body. Okay. Just, I mean, it's, it's a big concept to understand, but there's blue blood, red blood, and they're not mixing. So that little tube, that PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, is their only lifeline to oxygen. So what does prostaglandins do? The synthetic prostaglandins that we do guarantee we keep oxygenation to the body. So it increases oxygen saturation. And because they have enough oxygen saturation, you are gonna see the heart being able to pump more effective. And it does prevent things like central nervous system involvement because oxygen is going where it needs to go. Again, there's your PDA. How would you know there's a PDA? I mean, now I like to listen to PDAs when I'm trying to close them. I mean, when it's open and we know it's open because the oxygen saturation levels are really high, um, you're gonna hear this machine like murmur in there. You can hear this tiny little tube creates that big, big murmur. Um, another thing is, you know, all right, so we have a transposition, we have uh, saturation's good, we hear the murmur, okay, that patent ductus is working really, really well. Now, what if I wanna close it? Now I'm gonna give that indomethacin to stop prostaglandins from being secreted, and I'm probably gonna start to hear that murmur go away, aren't I? That's one of the things you hear, is that murmur's gonna go away. Another thing that we see um, is the blood pressures on these children. Now an infant's blood pressure 60 over 40 is normal. It's a perfectly normal blood pressure on an infant. A child with a patent ductus arteriosus that is open, you might see 60 over 18. 60 over 18, wide, wide pulse pressure. That's what that means. So if we're trying to close it, and we see now that 60 over 18 is now 60 over 30. We know it's closing, don't we? Because we see those numbers changing. Remember, atresia is when A without, there's no opening, like the right atrium, the right ventricle, as mentioned before. There is no opening there's no valve. That valve in between the right atrium and right ventricle is called a tricuspid valve. If there's no opening, that is called a tricuspid atresia. Makes sense, doesn't it? If I didn't have a pulmonary artery was an opening, that'd be a pulmonary atresia. So a stenosis is when there is a little opening going on. A lot of times you'll see this with aortic stenosis. So as the left ventricle pumps to the body, it's narrowed, but there is still blood going on there. So A is without, stenosis means there's an O, there's an opening, but it's small. So post-op chest surgery, you could have three, four, chest tubes, very, very common. And they're usually removed, oh, third to fourth day when the amount of drainage goes to minimal and they take it out. Now, older children, you know, that are two, three, they know what's going on around them and they're scared. I mean, there's pumps, there's noises, 
there's machinery and you know they're they're anxious so we need to take those chest tubes out to um, um which is part of their care so how are we going to do it with the least um you know amount of stress on that child well number one you need to tell them that it's going to hurt a little bit and then it stops and that you'll do everything you possibly can to stop that pain from occurring okay you need to elevate the head of their bed um because we're giving pain medicines for this child medicate do their vital signs before and after and we're going to teach on their level, elevate the head of the bed. And then of course, um, we're going to tell that kid what a great job they did when it's all done. They want to know what's going on and they want you to be honest with them. And once those chest tubes out and I've had adults tell me, I've never had one, thank goodness, but it does, it burns for like 15, 20 seconds and then the burning stops. So I know that's, that's the way it happens because I've worked with adults also. So transplants, biggest risk is rejection. That's why they're on immunosuppressants for the rest of their life, right? They're on anti-rejections for the rest of their life. I mean, yeah, infection's always a risk, but you know, it is rejection and it's usually within the first six months. Rheumatic fever. This is now there's going to be another one when we get to GU, but it's caused from a sore throat. So if you see a child having fevers, joint pain, you're going to see this rash, you see these nodules on their fingers, and maybe you see that really weird shuffling gait called chorea. All of that stuff will disappear once you know you figure out it's from a strep throat. And again, you're just going to treat the strep throat. You're going to give amoxicillin or augmentin, whatever the physician wants. All of it will go away, except if they've damaged their valves and their heart, that's permanent valve damage. So as soon as we can catch this, as soon as we can find it out, start antibiotics is the best for that child. Now, you'll be very surprised. Many of the medications we use in adults in uh, cardiac uh, problems, we use in children, but we'll use a mics per kilo, milligrams per kilogram. They're all used and used very, very, very safely. Now, digoxin, probably the most popular of all the drugs they use. It slowers and increases the strength of contractility in a heart, which means it tries to make the heart be as best as it can. So, we know in adults what we do if this, if this adult is having toxicity, but what do we do for children, especially infants? Infants get this medicine. So we're gonna look at the heart rate. So if it's less than 90 in an infant or less than 70 in a child, number one, I'm not giving digoxin, calling the physician, and I'm gonna do a dig level. Another thing you might see is, you know, besides that bradycardia is like retching or vomiting. Now, I don't care if the kid is a history of, you know, regurge, you know, but if I have a borderline heart rate, which you'll see and vomiting again, this is showing me they are signs of dig toxicity. Hold the dose, call the physician and do your dig level. Get prepared to give digoxin, you know, um, antidotes. And then we get a kid in, uh, kids complaining of failure to thrive and they're tachypnic and tachycardic and they're in congestive failure. And uh, we figure out the kid has a problem. Let's say it's a coarctation. That's a, that's a great one to, to, to look at be prepared to do a catheterization. Whenever you determine it's cardiac, you are gonna go for a cardiac catheterization. Now, pre-op, pre-catheterization, you know, it's just minimal treatment. And, you know, infants can eat up till two hours before they go. Um, older children will be held MP a little bit longer. It's not like adults after midnight. No, we feed our kids up almost to the end because they need their food to the end. Now, 
post catheterization, our biggest priority is to check that pressure bandage, looking to see if there's swelling, ecchymosis, or bleeding. If you can imagine the femoral artery and vein in that right groin, which is what they use, it is um, big, big vessels. And coming back from the catheterization procedure, they could have dislodged the clot that was there. And we could have bleeding out infant, you know, within minutes. I mean, infants don't have that much blood. And this is a big hose about this big, you know, that squirting blood. So number one, check that dressing. If it's bleeding or you see big ecumenic area, you're going to take two fingers above, closer to the heart, closer to the head, and apply pressure because the blood comes from the heart downward. So above it, you're going to push it. And then, of course, you call for some help. Uh, Post-procedure, you're going to keep the leg straight. You can't move it. They cannot get out of bed for 24 hours. They can uh, drink and eat. Yes, they can. Um, they need to um, because they still need fluids going on. And we'll be monitoring glucoses because infants, especially, they might have gotten some sugar in the IV in the calf, or maybe they didn't. So blood glucose could be high or low. So we're going to be checking on that but you're going to keep the legs straight. You're going to look at that dressing, number one priority, put fingers on it in case it is bleeding, you know, and then you'll call for help. And you know, older kids cannot get out of bed for 24 hours. Now, ITP is the lecture of this week and ITP P platelets. What do platelets do? They help when you're bleeding to put up the dam to stop bleeding. So what do you see with ITP? Well, usually it's post uh, upper respiratory infection, you know, within the last couple of weeks and you'll see it. And sometimes it's just a chronic condition, but you're going to see um, thrombocytopenia, which means low platelets. Um, and you're gonna see that they're bleeding. Many times it's just that tiny little petechial rash that you see in the picture here. And the parents are like, well, the kid doesn't go out. The kid plays games all day. I don't know how they're bruising. Or it could be even epistaxis, nosebleeds that brings them in there. So what you see with ITP is platelets. Just the platelets are way, way too low. Now, how do we treat this? Well. Hopefully it's just this an acute stage that we can treat it and go away. Um, so we're gonna give um, IV immunoglobulin. So IVIG and some anti-D antibody. And as a nurse, what are you watching for? Because we need to know as a nurse, what do we do? Well, number one, we will not do any venipunctures, whether it's for IVs, whether it's for lab works, whether it's to give medication, we're not going to do any unnecessary vena punctures. We're going to be monitoring them for bleeding, whether it's in their urine or their stool, their gums. We're also going to be watching their CBCs because usually these will get at least uh, once a day uh, complete blood count, CBCs, and they're going to monitor their platelet count. And then the other thing we do is corticosteroids. Now, one of the things students do all the time is they think children with ITP need fluids. And I'm going to ask you why. They don't need fluids. Who needs fluids? It's sickle cell children need fluids to dilate the vessels to get that clog away. But ITP, all you need to do is monitor their bleeding, um, give the medications as said here. Now, an immune issue, HIV in children. Now, children can get HIV, um, could come from mom, or it could be, you know, um, as they're younger, um, things happen and rape, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, let's just talk about how uh, a pregnant mother with HIV, how should we should be able to these children? Well, we know that um, children 
infants born with HIV, our goal is to um, support the infant's immune function. So we do that how? Well, HIV is a virus, right? So we need to give them antivirals to help support that immune system, okay? Um, good nutrition always, always helps. And um, in infants, you know, the things that we might see them have is you might see a couple of different things. The most um, common of all opportunistic infections is PCP pneumonia. That's the number one thing we see. And it's usually in between three to six months, we'll see that. You might see other stuff. You might see the candida um, esophagitis and all of that, in which we treat with the normal sort of things. But we know that the most common is PCP pneumonia. So treatment for these infants is to support their immune function. And as I was telling my class, I have seen children born with an HIV mother become not HIV by a year old because they were treated in the proper manner. I've seen triplets born where one had AIDS, one had HIV, and one had nothing. So it is possible to convert children from a parent who had HIV. And then anemia. Most common of all is what? Iron deficient anemia. So how do we um, treat iron deficient anemia? Well, the child needs iron. How do we give iron? Well, hopefully we could have them eat the proper things, but it doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes we give it orally, but it's not good enough or they need more. Um, we can also give iron dextran. And this is a very thick, um, like a golden brown orange liquid and it burns. So we give this deep Z track, I am. Um, so it doesn't stain the skin, it doesn't burn the skin also. I mean, one of the things they do get fatigued because their red blood cells are low, right? You don't have red blood cells. What does the red blood cells do? Well, it carries oxygen, right? One second. All right, I hung up on you. I'm sorry, guys. So if you don't have red blood cells, what's going to happen? Well, you're not carrying oxygen to the body, right? And if you don't have oxygen, how are you going to feel? Tired. So you're, these children will be fatigued. They're not going to have energy because they don't have oxygen because they don't have red blood cells. That makes sense, doesn't it? Megablastic anemia is from your B12 intrinsic factor. It's the promiscuous anemia. So what do we do? We give B12 injections to these children. Hemolytic anemia is sometimes due to some medicine. There's uh, one in your pharmacology book uh, that was written of G6P something. It has to do with giving some medications to children. It causes red blood cells just to burst. And that's what that one means. Sickle cell anemia, we've heard of this before. We know that these are cells that are shaped in a sickle and it, it, it is inherited from the parents. Um, Cooley's anemia, um, there's all types of thalassemia. There's four different types, but I told you Cooley's is the name to remember, which is the most severe. And what happens is there are these rectangular shaped red blood cells. And inside red blood cells, there's iron, right? There's oxygen and iron. And these cells burst. So what happens? Well, your oxygen goes away. So there's no oxygen. So you're having lack of oxygen. But that iron inside that cell that bursts creates your body to go toxic. So what is our concerns? Lack of oxygen and too much iron. How do we treat it? We give medications to get the iron. It's called iron chelating medications to get rid of that iron. And then we're going to give transfusions with good uh, blood cells with oxygen for them. And then aplastic anemia, all forms of blood, your white cells, red blood cells, platelets are all 
um, not making the cells. And again, this one also requires blood transfusions. So we're gonna give a blood transfusion and you see a patient getting it and all of a sudden they're short of breath, their neck veins just go distending, they start coughing and you know, you say, oh, something's going on. The first thing we do with any symptom like this, turn off the um, transfusion. It could be all of a sudden a rash, could all of a sudden spike a fever, you know, but what is this? This is actually circulatory overload. And the reason why it is, is that jugular vein distension. There's just too much fluid going on in there. And we'll treat that by stopping the blood and uh, giving some diuretics. Okay, sickle cell anemia. Let's go a little bit further into that. Now, this is one of those diagnoses that you will see, you know, repeatedly. You'll see it on HESI, you're going to see it on NCLEX, and it's a very common type of disease that we will see in, in the population. So, what happens with sickle cell is your red blood cells are in a weird shape and they die really quickly. So, you're not getting oxygen to the body again. What happens is these little sickle shapes tend to get clogged up somewhere in the body. Usually you'll see it from fever, dehydration are the two big things that create these sickle crises. So when you have a child who is now, let's say their hand is swollen, their knee hurts, history sickle cell, you see the swelling, how are you going to treat? What is priority? Well, you could treat a symptom, or you can, treat, you can treat the cause. The cause of the pain that they're getting is because blood can't go through the vessel. So number one priority, hydrate. Start an IV, give a bolus of fluid, dilate that vessel. The other way you do it is by giving heat, again, dilating the vessel. And of course, you're also going to be giving this child your pain medicine with it. But number one priority, IV. And that's how the confusion between ITP and fluids and sickle cell. Remember, ITP is no fluids. So children with cancer, you know, we know that many children with cancer have to go through a process of chemotherapy um, things. We know that induction is that beginning part of chemotherapy. And in induction is those first four to six weeks where they're given a whole different slew of different types of medications. And a lot of them fight the, uh, well, fight cells that we need. And one of them is white cells called neutrophils, okay? When the neutrophils levels goes too low, below 500, this child is at severe risk of infection. It is usually on that day five to seven where it's the lowest. So as a nurse, what does that mean to you? Well, if I have a child with a neutrophil count that is 500, undergoing chemotherapy, so they have no defense, I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to be monitoring their lab values, values and I'm going to be monitoring things like their temperature because this is very, very serious at this point. So neutrophils, 500 or low, is my priority patient. First one I'm gonna see on the unit because um, this child can go into septic shock. Now leukemia has to do with blood forming cells that come from the bone marrow. And the, um, these children, uh, once they're diagnosed, usually they have pain, bruising, um, and then we're going to see fever, uh, general uh, fatigue, and they do a CBC and we're gonna show the white counts are very, very low. Once we determine it is uh, leukemia, we're gonna be doing the chemo. So again, they start that initial chemo and the initial point of giving chemo is called induction. 
And it's literally that first four to six weeks is when we need to know that we're trying to eradicate everything. So our goal of induction is remission. The other three steps of treating with chemo is to take care of all those little bits and pieces that may have gotten through the cracks, you know, that are still there. We want to get rid of them. But our initial is to just go in there and zap that body and get rid of as much as possible. We need to make sure that we premedicate these children. They will be nauseous given it 30 minutes before and then periodically through the day as it is ordered. Osteosarcoma. This is a cancer of the femur bone and it's usually your adolescence. So again, this is body image time where we need to like cut off a piece of leg or we need to cut off the leg and reattach the lower leg back up into the body. And it, it is quite a lot of emotional distress for these children. You know, they're gonna go through chemo and they're gonna go through surgery. Now, our goal with osteosarcoma is to salvage the limb. Now that femur area from the knee up to the hip, it's gotta be gone because it all that bone all carries some sort of cancer in it. But the lower leg can be reattached up into the hip. And what it does, it provides a place for a prosthesis to be put so they're able to be as mobile as they possibly can, okay? So our goal is to salvage the limb. We don't wanna cut the whole leg off if we do not have to, we wanna salvage it. So with leukemia, it's called that unrestricted proliferation of immature white blood cells. One of the treatment is also bone marrow transplant. Now, we know that, you know, the lecture, you know, this week told us that it's usually your younger children ages two to five. We know today it's um, many physicians want to know if you want to save their umbilical cord blood, which can be used in case you had leukemia. So yes, it's expensive, but, you know, um, if we have the donor's own um, stem cells from that umbilical cord, we can treat the leukemia with it. Now, there's two types of bone marrow transplant. Autologous means automatically mine. Auto means self. That means it came from the person. That means usually these children had saved their umbilical cord blood. That's usually what that means. Older children might have had it there for some other reasons, but usually it's just that, you know, their umbilical cord. If it comes from somebody else, um, it's called allergenic. I mean, the second person, which is actually the best, would be your brother or your sister. That actually tends to work the best. But if we had our druthers and we had it, if I had my own um, cord blood, that would be what we would use to treat leukemia. Now, brain tumors. Now, brain tumors, solid tumors, you know, are, you know, tumors that grow into the brain. The thing with uh, brain tumors is that, you know, they start and they're small and they grow. So initially you might have, you know, a headache sometimes. Um, initially you might vomit like with no correlation to eating, but you would. But when you start suspecting brain tumors is when the headache progressively gets worse and the vomiting gets worse and worse. So it's progressively worse. It's not just a one-time thing, it's progressive. Another thing is usually these brain tumors, they are gonna be doing radiation to try to shrink them or before they do surgery, if they can. Remember those markings, we never remove them. Um, because that is where they have to put the machine to zap with radiation. And then the other sort of cancer is uh, in the lymphs. So we know that blood and lymph are the two big ones that children are, they do um, have most of the cancers with the blood uh, um, cancers and the lymph nodes. Now there's two sorts of lymph nodes. Um, type of cancer. One is called Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, Hodgkin lymphoma, 
This is actually one you could see. Now, where is, um, I didn't put the picture here. Hodgkin's lymphoma usually is from, you know, the supraclavicular cervical area up which means you might see a big thick nodule on the neck, like a big one, and you could see it there. It doesn't hurt. It's this big, it's like, doesn't that hurt? And you're like, no. And you can move it around and play with it and they don't care, all right? Now, because it's in the neck, it, pre, it puts some swelling on the trachea and you could have this cough, okay? Just because of the pressure in there. Now, non-Hodgkin's, are fine little sort of um, nodules that you really can't see. That's the difference in these two. So as you see, Hodgkin's is localized, maybe the neck things. Non-Hodgkin's are all over, but they're smaller and you really can't tell it as much. And those are the difference. We treat them the same way, chemo and um, sometimes radiation on these children. Of course, if we have a Hodgkin's lymphoma, we can see the node, we can do a biopsy. It's harder to find the biopsy on the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you're still gonna have five simple dosage calculation problems. I know you can do this. Any questions, anybody needs anything, please holler for me and I will help you. I will send out all of your cahoots and they're there for you, okay? Any questions? You said the cahoots you want to send out to, um, to I everybody. will, when I send my recording later tonight, mm -hmm. I will put my weeks four, five, six cahoots, and I'll put my recording to every professor. If you have issues finding it, you know my name. You can just holler, holler. You know that. Can I ask you one more question? I'm sorry. To, yes, um, ma'am. With a child as a post-operative child, what's the best way to get them cooperate, like a post-operative child that has been out of surgery? Well, number one, it's what you've done to prepare them for surgery, if you can, if okay. you have that opportunity. But if you are pain-free or pain is less, you'll be more willing to cooperate, especially if they know the quicker they cooperate and do what they need to do, the quicker they go home. So basically you're saying that if they're not having any pain, they will cooperate with you as far as what they need to do to get well. Wouldn't you cooperate better? If yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I know children, adults can be, you know, kind of different, you know. They're different and the same. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs>